My name is Melissa Klimaszewski, and I teach at Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa. Thank you for this opportunity to talk to you about Little Dorrit. I'm very excited about it, and um, I'm very excited about the collaboration between the Dickens Project and your class. So, um, thinking about the second installment, which is my focus today, I actually want to take us back to the end of the first installment, which is the end of chapter four. If you think back to that, chapter four ends with Jeremiah Flintwich uh, choking Afri, his wife, on the stairs. She has come down to the landing, she's witnessing something, she's not exactly sure what she's seeing, and when, after Mr. Flintwich sees her, he, he puts his hand on her throat, he chokes her, until she's black in the face, it says on page 58. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, that's a very alarming image. And if you think about 19th century readers, they had to wait an entire month to find out what happens next. So even though this couple goes back to their bedroom, he's sort of threatening her with another dose, and there's clearly a lot of violence in the relationship. So that would have been in one's thoughts for an entire month before seeing what happens next. And those are places in the text where regularly when you see those little asterisks that mean there's a break in the installment, ask yourself what's being emphasized and um, you know how this would affect what you might, how you might process what comes next. So then when chapter five begins, we do still have Flint Witch, but we go in a fairly different direction uh, with what happens, and most of the second installment is giving us the backstories for multiple characters and things that have gone on, um, and we finally get the description of Amy Dorrit on page 67. That's a description I would encourage you to pay very close attention to, to do a close reading of the details describing her, and to think about what kind of contradictions there are in the description of this character. Think about her name, for instance, and the fact that she is at least 22 years old. <laughs> when you read the description and when you see how she behaves, I think we tend to have an image of a child or a teenager, and she's at least 22 years old. This is a grown woman. So that opens up questions about uh, the tension between the word little and the word Dorrit. So we have tension right in the two words of the title of the book that also are embodied in the title character. So there's a lot of complicated things you could talk about there. And I think it's also important to think about who calls her Amy and who calls her Little Dorrit whether the narrator is consistent in that um, name, and what are you calling her in your mind when you read? Are you calling her Amy, or are you calling her Little Dorrit? And think about what's at stake um, in, in that name. The other thing I would point out uh, is chapter 6, which is called The Father of the Marshalsea. I would ask you, what does it mean to be the father of a place? That's sort of strange to call someone the father of a place, and it doesn't just have to do with how old he is and the fact that he's the oldest there. Part of what we get in chapter six um, is this description of Amy's birth and the Marshalsea itself, and that starts to open up questions about different types of definitions of prisons and homes which you've probably already started to talk about. But I would encourage you to really push on that idea of what is a prison, what do we associate with prison, what do we associate with home, and um, how is this book really complicating those things and challenging us to think about them in maybe more complex ways than we usually do. So for instance, um, if we look at pages 78 and 79, when the doctor is, um, you know, we're getting the story of Amy's birth and we, we get the doctor saying things like on page 78, it's freedom, sir, it's freedom. 
and he's talking about prison. So how can you have freedom in a prison if we're defining prison as a place you go when you don't have liberty of physical movement? Is it possible to have freedom in prison? If it is, uh, what does this book seem to be saying about that? And what might we learn from thinking that you could actually have freedom in a prison? And is that kind of a dangerous thing to think? Is that a liberating thing to think? Um, on page 79, the doctor also says, what have we found? Peace. That's the word for it. Peace. I'm not sure that most of us would associate peace with prison, um, because peace by definition, opposes violence, and I think we're much more prone to associate violence with prison. So again, in this second installment, the book is complicating things, and I would encourage you to pursue those complications, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your reading.